Hi everyone, welcome to our first video for vertebrate natural history. This is the vertebrate basics video. And this is kind of an introduction to vertebrates and you'll have videos um, for each of the taxa that we go through through the semester. And for each of the videos, we'll start out with a slide like this where it explains what you should know by the end of the video. And we'll revisit the list at the end of each video so that you can make sure that you got everything. And if you didn't, you can always go back and look at sections again. So for this video, by the end, you'll be able to explain the evolutionary history of vertebrates on Earth, describe common vertebrate characteristics, identify adaptations and explain their function and evolution, describe different forms of temperature regulation, as well as locomotion in vertebrates. So we'll start with just looking at kind of a timeline of life on earth to orient ourselves and um, with where vertebrates come on the picture. So the earth is 4.6 billion years old and the oldest evidence of life on earth dates back to about three and a half to 4 billion years ago. For, so for most of earth's existence, there has been some form of life on earth. But the first vertebrates didn't come on the scene until 600 million years ago. So far more recent um, than that. And then the first land animals were 400 million years ago. First dinosaurs were 200 million years ago. So we're looking at vertebrates being really just in the, the most recent part of Earth's history. When you look at hominids, so the first human-like uh, animals four million years ago, and then Homo sapiens, so humans, have been on Earth for about 500,000 years, which is really just like a blink <laughs> in the, the eye of, of Earth's life. Classification comes into play a lot in this class because we're going to go through different taxa of vertebrates. You're going to learn how to identify individuals within each of the taxa. And so kind of a refresher on classification basics is an important place to start. I'm sure you've learned many times the five kingdoms. Um, sometimes you, we talk about domains as the level above kingdoms and that really matters if you're talking about bacteria. We're not talking about bacteria. So we'll stick with the five kingdoms. All vertebrates are within the animal kingdom, so that's what we're focusing on in this class. Similarly, all vertebrates are in the phylum chordata and the subphylum vertebrata. So there's a couple chordates like sea squirts um, that are chordata but not vertebrata. So there's a little bit of a distinction there. I like to sometimes on um, lab practicals, hint, hint, have a question that asks subphylum, freaks everybody out, like we didn't, we didn't need to know subphylum. I didn't study that. Every single species that we do this whole semester is in subphylum vertebrata. Don't get freaked out. No freaking out. So this um, picture here just shows kind of how when you go down through the levels of classification, you get more specific when you get to genus and species. That's your scientific name. So you'll become well acquainted with scientific names in here. Um, in Again, we'll really be working from class down, phylum and kingdom are the same for everything that we do in here. A cladogram is an important thing to be able to interpret when you're looking at different clades of plants, animals, whatever it is, we're focused again on vertebrates. So in a cladogram, it shows evolutionary relationships by using lines like this. And so, you can see that um, on here, we start with vertebrates right around here where we have vertebrae. So everything from here up is a vertebrate. And when there's a, a branch off, like the base of the V shows that there was a common ancestor at some point. And the smaller the V shows a closer relationship. So crocodiles and birds are actually very closely related. See that little V? Uh, and then the bigger the V means the less closely related. We'll look at those as we go through the semester. You can also look at kind of a similar diagram, but overlaid on a timeline. Um, 
And so this is a evolutionary timeline where you can see when the branching actually happened, like what period in evolutionary history did different clades branch off. Some common vertebrate characteristics. So it's important to understand what all vertebrates have in common before we start talking about what the different groups have specific to them. All vertebrates have a vertebrae or a backbone, um, a spine. So you can see that even in all the different groups, you can identify that backbone. So I found this nice figure, but it excluded the amphibians. So I added our um, frog skeleton over there. They also all have a brain case or a cranium, just different word for the same thing. Fish brains are very small, so their cranium is very small. Um, but and we can tell different things about the skull. So we'll we'll talk about that as we go through the different taxa. All vertebrates have cartilage or bone or both. So a lot of vertebrates have both cartilage and bone. We have cartilage and bone. Some things like sharks have just cartilage, others have just bone. Most vertebrates, there's oftentimes exceptions to certain things when we talk about vertebrates, but most have paired appendages and limb girdles. Like you think about snakes, you say, well, they don't have paired appendages, like paired arms or paired legs or paired fins. But actually you can, in most snakes, find vestigial leg bones and a limb girdle, like a pelvic girdle. So pretty neat. Um, Vertebrates have shared a shared characteristic in their embryonic development where they have pharyngeal clefts or sometimes they're called pharyngeal pouches that look kind of like gill slits and they're the primitive, they're the structures that will lead to the respiratory system and in different taxa that can mean lots of different things. It could mean gills, it could mean lungs. Um, so they differentiate greatly as they get further along in evolutionary development, but as early embryos can see those pharyngeal clefts. Across all the vertebrates, there is amazing diversity in a lot of different ways. One way that's very easy to see is the diversity in size. So there are some fish and some frogs that are less than a centimeter in size. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, we have the largest land animal, an elephant that can be uh, over 5,000 kilograms in weight and the largest mammal, um, the largest vertebrate on earth, the blue whale, um, over 170,000 kilograms. So a kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So if you want to do the math there, so elephants can be like more than 10 tons. So they can be ginormous. There's diversity in a lot of other ways too. So there's a wide variety of habitats that vertebrates can live in from polar bears in the Arctic, um, horned lizards that are living in very dry, arid desert environments, frogs in the in tropical rainforest. They, and you can just see the tree frogs um, adaptations to, to living in the environment with the big toe pads, this is called a barrel fish. They live so far down in the ocean, there's virtually no light, very few species live there. They have this really neat adaptation where their eyes, these are their eyes actually that point straight up and they kind of illuminate uh, what's above them. Their eyesight isn't great, but they can see shadows. And so if something travels through the illumination, they see a shadow and when that happens, they turn upright and gulp their prey from below. It really is fascinating how these adaptations um, evolve through evolutionary history. And it's, it's just really neat, the, the span of adaptations that exist across vertebrates. We also have the, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Birds that can live on a cliffside where very few other species live. So these adaptations that allow species to, to live in areas that others don't and to, to expand their niche in areas where other things can't, it, it allows for their successful survival and reproduction. And that's exactly what an adaptation is. So 
Adaptations are characteristics that individuals have that allow them to persist in a population through natural selection. So natural selection says that in populations, there's variation, right? In a, in a population of any species, there aren't identical individuals. They, there's all, there's variation across different individuals and different variations might help individuals survive and reproduce better than others. And so those, those characteristics that do help individuals survive and reproduce are those that are gonna persist in the population because if we're surviving and reproducing, you're passing on those traits um, and increasing fitness. So these are some examples of adaptations in vertebrates. So you may know that male seahorses have like a brood pouch. So eggs are laid into that pouch, they develop in there and it looks like he's giving live birth um, to the baby seahorses. This is, a, this is a basilisk lizard, sometimes called a Jesus lizard. They utilize the surface tension of water to run across water. Look at that, bat's ears, my gosh, so giant to maximize echolocation. Poison dart frogs have an adaptation where to um, re avoid predation because of the poison toxic secretions. Um, peregrine falcons can dive at um, crazy speeds. Um, so there's there's these different, different adaptations that set species apart and do allow for greater success in survival and reproduction and that's why they've persisted. So these adaptations are things that we're going to be thinking about when we look at different taxa throughout the semester. We're going to think about how is this increasing survival and reproduction? Why did this adaptation persist? and which of these adaptations are specific to different taxa. So if we see the specific adaptation, does it tell us, oh, this is a fish or this is a reptile? Vestigial structures are, are different from adaptations. So vestigial structures are characteristics that become reduced or sometimes even absent over time, not because they're helping survival and reproduction, but because they're not used. So in the example of cave fish that live in complete darkness in the waters of caves, their eyes have become reduced because they aren't used. So it doesn't matter whether they have them or not to survive and reproduce and pass on their genes. And so over time they've become reduced. That's a vestigial structure. There's some different strategies for temperature regulation in vertebrates. And generally, the strategy is similar within a taxa. So there's two different kind of, um, two different things to think about when we think about temperature regulation. There's how variable the body temperature is and then how the body temperature is regulated. So how variable, we have poikilothermy and homeothermy. Poikilothermy is, the term for variable body temperature. So any animal whose body temperature fluctuates would be considered poikilothermic. Homeothermic means there's a constant body temperature or relatively constant body temperature. And then we have ectotherms and endotherms. Ectotherms acquire their body heat from their environment um, through the sun maybe or through um, different substrates. Endotherms derive their body heat from metabolism. And so typically we think of ectotherms as being poikilothermic. So if they're getting their body heat from the environment, their body heat's probably gonna fluctuate, right? Whereas endotherms, um, when body heat's derived from metabolism, like we maintain a relatively constant body temperature averaging for humans, 98.6. So generally endotherms are homeothermic, but there are definite exceptions. Think about mammals that are endothermic, but that hibernate, where when they hibernate, their body temperature drops drastically. So during that hibernation, coming in and out of hibernation, they exhibit some poikilothermy. Alternatively, there are some reptiles and some fish that have really neat adaptations where even though they're ectothermic, 
the, the range of their body temperature is not as drastic as their environment. So they're somewhat homeothermic. So understanding the difference between poikothermy, homeothermy, and ectothermy, endothermy is an important one as we go through the taxa of vertebrates. Types of locomotion are also important to, um, to understand going into the different taxa when you see these words to understand what they mean. So terrestrial is probably one that you're already familiar with, but some terrestrial vertebrates are quadrupeds. So we're walking on four limbs. Some are bipedal um, on two limbs. So when you, I say bipedal, you might think of humans. Maybe you think of ostriches. <laughs> uh, aerial can be either gliding like a, um, like a flying squirrel or actually actual flight like birds or bats. Saltatorial is the word for animals that get around by jumping. And arboreal are those that move through the trees. And there are some species of primates that very rarely even touch the ground. They really spend their life in the trees, but they don't fly. Um, they don't really jump. So circling back to our first slide about what you should be able to do by the end of the video, go through these five and make sure you have an idea of um, each of these. If there's anything that's fuzzy, go back in the video and review. I like to end videos sometimes with a joke or a cartoon or story, something like that. So as we, you know, as we go through the text, so we're going to talk about evolutionary changes that um, that exist between the taxa and the far side cartoons, if you're not familiar with them, they were super popular when I was a little kid. And um, this is one that explains clearly how vertebrates got from the water to land. You don't need any other explanation, right? All right. So thank you so much for listening. I look forward to seeing you in class. Have a good one. I need to find where to stop recording. There it is.